Um, my name is Tony Butler. I've got the privilege of being the moderator of the Northern Baptist Association, especially in this time of transition and exciting uh, things that are happening. And we, we pray that today you will particularly be envisioned and encouraged about mission and pioneering. But in this uh, time of transition and because of COVID, there have been all sorts of things that have changed in our local churches. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to introduce you to those who come into ministry in that time. Now, my list did not have Fiona in, but I realised that Fiona Preston, who is going away, <laughs> actually came in just as COVID started and has never actually been formally welcomed into the Northern Baptist Association. So forgive us for that, will you, Fiona? And it's lovely to have you here. Uh, and then we've got um, uh, Joel Mercer, who is sitting on the back row like all good Baptists. Um, Joel has come as the pastor at Whitley Bay, the team leader. And then Craig Downs, has uh, Craig arrived yet? They are. Craig Downs is at Stockton. Now I never know, because I'm so old fashioned now, I don't know whether to call it Stockton Tabernacle or it's something new. Don't call it something new, because you're definitely wrong. Um, <laughs> Everybody calls it the tab, so we're thinking of engaging with church funds by tiny everybody every time they say the tab, let's put a pound in there. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> and then we've got Phil Dixon. Phil oh, right down here at the front at Oxford Road, Hartley Paul. And Peter Wallace at Lakeside. I know there's uh, Mike here from Lakeside, so. Uh, member there. And then Rachel Holland. Hey. Hey, yeah. hey. Rachel is the most recent one who's just had her husband here, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> they, they swap because of the children. So that's lovely to have Dan here. We do take our greetings back and Rachel has been uh, inducted and ordained at the same time as a community pastor at Poor Track Baptist Church. And that's lovely to, to see that work developing and growing. And finally, and I've left it to last, uh, Hayley Young, <laughs> the masked bandit. <laughs> um, Hayley has become our TSL, our Transitional Strategic Leader. Um, but uh, she'll probably sort of say more about herself later, won't you? That's very good. And Ah, right, okay. Okay, so I know Peter Webster from Marsden Road and Karen Smith. Thank you very much. And they're ministers in training. Thank you. That's very helpful, Linda. Um, final thing to say there is that we have. Um, a copy of the Baptists of the North East of England for all of you who have come into ministry during this time. <laughs> Brilliant. It's a Saturday morning. It's so good to be here, sons and daughters of the Most High God. It's great to be able to share uh, with you this morning. So, we're going to be the whole theme of the assembly is join the adventure, and it's about us building together for God's kingdom. I'm sure you will have heard a bit about me, uh, but in true millennial style. Please do follow me on all of my social media. Uh, please give me a like, give me a follow, give me a subscribe. You'll notice I'm vlogging my uh, way through this transition period and my presidential uh, theme of building a bigger table. So weekly, I will drop a vlog explaining a little bit about the life of the association and all that the transition holds. And I do that so no one can say we don't know what the regional team are doing. Okay, it's there, it's on YouTube every week. A little bit about me, so I grew up in a non-Christian household. When I was 17, I had a vision of Jesus, uh, and God told me to read the Bible, so I started reading the Bible. Um, and then I knocked on a Baptist church door and said, I, I want to follow Jesus. Uh, I know he died for me, uh, and I want to follow him. And uh, so the minister at the time, he's a great friend of mine now, who used to work for Care for the Family, Richard Harvey, said to me, we'll come to church. So I did, and I went to church, and I went, I don't get it. I've fallen in love with Jesus, and I've read the Bible, and this is, this is what we've got. <coughs> and, and right then, God was calling me into ministry. 
And part of that is, is extending the table, I believe, and I'm going to take that theme into my presidential year. So people often say, you're quite excited, you get quite excited about the gospel. I'm excited about the gospel because it saves, it's the power, amen? amen? And so that's why we are joining the adventure. God's already on the adventure. You and I today have a choice of whether we're going to partner in that or stay in our chairs. But we as an MBA, is our slogan is building together for God's kingdom. And I really wanted to give these out to you at my induction, but because of everything, we did the induction online and I actually missed the post that day. So that was quite good. But I've got one of these for every church and it's a jigsaw piece. And my challenge is that when I come and visit the church, when Paul and I come and visit the church, is that these are somewhere, not under a desk. <laughs> I know what I was like as a minister. But in it, it just simply says, MBA building together for God's kingdom. You on your own as a church are great. You're sturdy. You're doing well. But when we are together, there is a better strength. And we all, all 50 of our churches and missional communities, have a place to part in building God's kingdom together. So yes, we can do it on our own, but let's remember that we are part of a bigger jigsaw. And the reality is that those 50 churches and missional communities aren't limited to the northeast, but it expands the 2,000 plus churches and missional communities of our Baptist family. But the budget didn't stretch that far, so we've just got 50 <laughs> churches here. But this morning I want to just share with you two passages of scripture. It's my kind of responsibility to do the encouraging bit. And then Paul is going to lead some missional stories after that. And don't worry, there's coffee in between. But I want to just uh, start by reading from Luke chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles with you, if they're on an iPhone or an uh, Android or an iPad, or just, just the Bible, that would be great. And look at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible says this, once while Jesus was standing beside the lake and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way for the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowd from the boat. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long and have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signalled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catchers of people. When they brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. It's amazing. It's well known, isn't it? So just indulge me, because we've known this story for a while. But at this part of the Gospel story, we reach the point where Jesus' fame is beginning to spread. People want to know about him. They want to see the miracles. Because actually, they weren't necessarily drawn to Jesus because of the things he said. They were drawn because of the miracles, the things he was performing. So crowds wanted to come and see, what, what was Jesus going to do next? And that's where we pick up this account. Jesus is by the sea. The crowds are gathered around him, pressing in on him. The situation potentially could have become quite tense. People wanted to know what was going to happen. So to avoid the crush, Jesus steps into a boat belonging to a man called Simon Peter, a fisherman. Not only was he a fisherman, he was a fisherman at the end of his shift. And Jesus pops into the boat and he says to Simon, who's sitting there packing up his nets, 
Let's go fishing. Now, I expect Simon at this point was looking forward to getting home, putting his feet up and forgetting about the day he just had. Because let's be honest, he's been fishing all night and caught nothing. He was ready to go home. He was tired. Obviously, he was disappointed because he'd been up all night, caught nothing, and suddenly, Jesus turns up and says, let's go fishing. Now, if I was Simon Peter, I might be thinking, you've got to be kidding me. I'm a fisherman. My dad was a fisherman. His dad was a fisherman. His dad was a fisherman. I know these waters. I've been fishing all night and caught nothing. But okay, Mr. Carpenter, if you say let's go fishing, then let's go. And sure enough, Simon Peter and Jesus go fishing. He may even have been writing his I told you so speech in his head to give to Jesus. But then, the most incredible thing happens. The boats begin to sway. The nets, they begin to creep. And then they pull. And as they pull, they in the flapping of hundreds of fish on the top of their nets. It's almost deafening. And Simon Peter has to call to his mates, please come and help. We've got so much, we need you. Our boats are going to sink with the abundance. We don't know what to do with all these fish. And you know the truth is, my friends, this morning, that the God we worship, the God we serve, is far bigger than we can ever imagine or fully comprehend. And the truth is, our God loves to blow our minds with the miraculous doings of his work. And Jesus uses this miracle to say, Hey, Simon Peter, you think this is amazing? You wait and see what I've got in store for you. Wait and see. The best is yet to come. And what Jesus said to Simon Peter that day, I believe Jesus is saying to all of our churches here in the NBA, The best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. We're still awake. Come on, guys. Amen. The best is yet to come. Amen. If we don't believe it, they're not going to believe it. You see, post lockdown, maybe there's a tendency to think, well, do you know what? We've been toiling. It's been hard work. We're tired at the moment. We are burdened. What we do is we're just wait. We'll just spend some time washing our nets. We'll wait for the new regional minister to come up with the new strategy. Then, whatever that will be, we'll reassess the situation and then we'll go again. You know what? Simon Peter was not a man who was used because he was willing. It was because he was great. He was used because he was willing. And I believe what Jesus said to Simon Peter that day, Jesus says to us now. Now is not the time to go home. Now is not the time to wash our nets and forget about it. There is still a harvest which needs to be caught. And this, you guys are the group of people that God is going to use to bring about his kingdom. Don't give up. Don't go home. Don't wash your nets. Jesus says, let's go fishing. And you know, what amazes me is Simon Peter's response. He just follows. But he doesn't do it without a revelation. You see, Peter, as I said, was willing. He was willing to take the next step. Despite being an absolute expert in his field, despite knowing the waters better than anybody else, he decided to listen to Jesus. He could have sat down with Jesus at that moment and said, look, Jesus, this is the reason why it won't work. I know these waters. I've read the books about it. I know the theory. We've done this before. Let me tell you why that won't work, Jesus. He doesn't. He's willing enough to give it another go. He put all of his experience, all of his professional training, which would have been crying out within him, this is ridiculous. He puts all of that aside. 
in order to give God control. Now, please don't hear me wrong. Studying, training, professional experience is good. But sometimes God calls us to do the ridiculous, seemingly ridiculous. We have to be willing to be fools for the gospel. Because sometimes God will ask us to do something that doesn't necessarily make sense in the natural. But God is in control. Just like Simon Peter, you and I today need to be willing to follow Jesus, even if it feels uncomfortable, even if it goes against our common sense. Don't forget, this is the guy that later witnessed over 2,000 people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. He was willing in the small act. I wonder, where is God asking you to be obedient in willingness? The best is yet to come, Amen. but we have to be willing to hear the Master's voice. The other thing is, he was humble. In that boat that day, Simon Peter got a glimpse of who God was. When that catch came in, he caught the very nature of who, human, of who Jesus was, fully human and yet fully divine. And as a result, he humbled himself before Jesus. And the amazing truth is today that God doesn't actually need us. Let's be real. God doesn't need us. But God chooses. God chooses to partner with you and me in bringing about the catch. God chooses you. You have a part to play in the story of bringing God's kingdom together in the Northern Baptist Association. Every single one of us has. Sometimes we can have a tendency to put the church leader in that place. Oh, we don't have to send gifts as they do. You probably don't, but you have gifts. What is God calling you to do in your place, in your community, in your church? When the people of God respond with humility and say, here I am, I want to work with you, we become this amazing instrument of God's grace. And then we see, don't we, Simon Peter leaves everything to follow Jesus. He leaves a fishing business, he leaves his livelihood, he leaves his family, all for the sake of Jesus. Now, that calling may not be yours to leave everything in that same way. But are you willing to understand what Simon Peter did? That there is no greater calling than the one to follow Jesus. You see, so many people put the, the crux of the Christian journey on that three-point prayer, coming to know Jesus. And that, that's important. I guess we can chat about that over coffee. But following Jesus isn't a one-off decision. It's a daily outworking of a living prayer within us. Choosing to die to self and follow him. It starts with acknowledging who God is, repenting of our sin. It starts with coming under the Lordship of Christ and following him, <coughs> laying down everything. And I've got to ask, why? Why would we want to live in any other place than under God's authority? And so the encouragement for us is that the best is yet to come. Jesus is calling us to go fishing with him. And my question to you this morning is, are you ready to go fishing? Are you willing to go fishing? I can see a few knots, which is great. <laughs> and maybe the answer is yes, but. Yes, but. Hayley, you've got no idea what I'm going through at the moment. And I don't. I don't. But how are we going to respond when we're sitting here thinking, but we've tried. Hayley, you're saying nothing new. We know this, we've read this, we've been encouraged to do this time and time again. We're tired. How do we do this in a fresh and new way? How do we make the gospel relevant to people? How do we prevent ourselves from only sharing the message with those who look like us? 
What do we do when people reject us? What do we do when we get it wrong? And so I want to share with you uh, an account from the scriptures. Because I think when we talk about mission, when we talk about adventure, yes, we can get all fired up and excited with the let's go fishing, but there's also a reality of how do we do mission in a, in a context like the ones we're living in today? How do we prevent ourselves from only going to those that are like us? And I want to retell a story that, if I'm honest, the first time I read it made me angry at Jesus. It's an account of a woman who's crying out to Jesus for help because her daughter is possessed and suffering. It's found in Mark 7 if you want to look at it. This woman is crying out to Jesus to help her daughter. And what does Jesus do? He ignores her. She continues to beg for his help. The disciples grow impatient with the woman. They ask Jesus to send her away because she won't stop shouting at them for help. He tells them he won't deal with her because he's sent only for the lost sheep of Israel. She must have heard him say those words because she fell at his feet. And she begs for help for her daughter. Then finally <coughs> Jesus speaks to her saying, Woman, it is not right to take food from the children's mouths and throw it to the dogs. <coughs> Ouch. <coughs> Quickly she says to him, of course you're right. But even the dogs get the crumbs at the table. Jesus then praises her faith and heals her daughter. But did you catch that? Did you catch it? Jesus ignored the desperate and pleading woman. He tells his disciples she isn't worth his time. He insults her by calling her a dog. As if being a woman in this culture isn't enough of a hill to climb. She's a cultural outsider to Jesus and his boys in every way. And she's making a nuisance of herself in front of the crowd. And rather than immediately leaping over those hurdles to welcome her and heal her daughter, Jesus seemingly ignores her. He insults her and he refuses her. There's no empathy, no compassion from the way that the story is written. But she persists. She refuses to let these men talk about her as if she's not there. She gets in the way, she doesn't get angry, she gets clever. And Jesus throws up his hands in the best, knowing he's been. Perhaps he even laughed, fine, you win. She gets what she wants, her daughter is healed. And in this account, unlike the first one, we're reminded a bit too strongly that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Sometimes we can lean so much into Jesus' divinity, we forget he also is a product of his time and culture just like us. And I'm sharing that with you because it shocked me. It shocks me. But perhaps Jesus was taught by this woman. Perhaps we're witnessing here Jesus' growth. Perhaps he was deeply struggling with his Jewish identity and the attitudes of the day. Perhaps he was conditioned to ignore people like her. Perhaps it was because she was a woman, or her cultural identity, or her race. After all, Jesus was fully human as he was God. So perhaps he had the capacity to be challenged on his cultural perspectives, then to grow and move on. In Mark's telling of this account, this is Jesus' first conversation with a Gentile. And it wouldn't be his last. But never again would he treat anyone like this. Never again did he treat anyone the way he initially treated this woman. The theologian Austin Stillman writes, Jesus shows us in this story that inheriting bias is inevitable, but holding on to it is a choice. I've thought often about this woman since first reading the story. I think of of it often when I think about missional adventure and what does it mean for me to be a kingdom person. The first time I read this, it made me mad at Jesus. 
How can this amazing God that I believe in act in this way? But actually, it's really instructive. And it's even convicting for us as a church today. Perhaps Jesus learnt in this moment. A woman taught him, he responded. The whole of scripture, the whole of the Bible shows us a God who is moved by compassion, a God who is persuaded, a God who responds, a God who is always moving towards us. And in this account, unlike the first one, Jesus isn't the hero, even though he ultimately heals the child. This woman, who is persistent, unrelenting, clever, turns insults into opportunities prevailed. She's an outsider who showed the insiders how it should be done in the kingdom of God. And my friends, that is the reality if we want to go fishing today. That's the reality. If we want to see the best is yet to come, if we want people to experience the amazing, awesome, healing, powerful nature of Jesus Christ, we have to acknowledge who we are. Just as Jesus did in this account. Sometimes we're caught out by our biases. But ultimately, we have an amazing adventure before us. God is already bringing everyone to his table. You and I can be part of that. But first we have to realise that we're products of who we are. And I say that as an inspiration and a challenge. Jesus didn't get it right in this situation. We don't always get it right. But what is different is Jesus allowed himself to be taught and never again did he act in that same way. And maybe that's what it's like for us when we're joining the adventure, when we're reaching out in mission, when we catch ourselves in our unconscious bias, when we find ourselves only hanging out with those who are like us. Let us be open to hear the voice of God from the outside who shows us what the kingdom of God is really like. And you may be saying, but Haley, what does that mean for me and my church right now? How do I go back and share that with others? I want to fish. I want to fish and I, I want to be open to everyone and I want to be like Jesus. I want to be teachable. What does it look like? Well, let me share this image with you. It's a it's a well-known image, and you've probably seen it before. I'm always smiling. I've probably nicked it off something he did. But it shows us that the adventure sometimes, and we will hear stories after coffee that Paul's going to lead us in, of different experiences of people joining in the adventure. And often we can think joining in the adventure is right out on that boat, doing the, doing the really weird stuff, doing the wacky stuff that we can't comprehend as church. But all of us have a step to move. And so I wonder where you would put your church on that spectrum. Are you a church replicator, an adapter, an innovator, or an activist? Where are you? What does that look like? What do I mean when I say that? Well, for some of us, mission and adventure means opening up our coffee morning to different people. For some of us, missional adventure looks like a messy church, a cafe church. For some of us, missional adventure means putting a sofa outside our church and having a cup of tea and chatting to those who come past. For some of us, missional adventure means painting a park bench. For some of us, missional adventure means leaving everything, buying a home in a new housing estate and being incarnation. For some of us, mission and adventure looks like moving into the rough side of town, rolling up our sleeves and modelling Jesus. And what we we'll want to say to you, what we as the MBA want to say to you today, is mission and adventure is mission and adventure for you. I don't mean to be flippant, but Paul and I 
don't really care if you do a messy church or move into a new housing estate. What we care about is if you'll be in Jesus' hands and feet in the place where he's called you. And we're here as a team to help equip and empower you in that. We can share stories. We can show what others are doing. But ultimately, we want to see you embrace missional adventure where it's at. And not be afraid of getting it wrong. Because my friends, what's the worst that can happen? Someone says, someone hears about Jesus. That's the worst that can happen. And if that's the worst that can happen, we're starting from a good place, friends. What does that look like? Well, many of you will know, I've mentioned it several times, my, my presidency theme is building a bigger table. You see, from this account that we read, in the two accounts that we've read, Jesus calls his disciples. He calls you. Those same disciples he's caught in a state of what I believe is unconscious bias. He changes his behaviour from that moment. And from that moment, how does Jesus hang out? How does Jesus interact with those on the outside? Well, he shares a meal with them. If he gets in trouble, people go, what's he doing? What's he doing sharing with those sinners? And I want to encourage you today, wherever you are, to be like Jesus. Simple, isn't it? You don't need to come here for me to tell you that. Be like Jesus. Call those around you that will walk the discipleship journey with you. And then reach out in a hospitable way, knowing that you'll make mistakes. You see, Jesus, after this moment, after this encounter, changed the way he behaved. He risked his reputation to hang out with sinners. You and I have the opportunity to do the same right now. We just need to be willing, we need to be humble, and we need to follow. And I wonder what the NBA will look like if we start doing that. If we start seeing missional adventure of somewhere along this spectrum, taking that small step, following Christ, then who knows? Maybe like Simon Peter, we'll end up seeing 2,000 people come to faith in one moment. And then we've got to believe it. See, we don't believe it, other people won't. What I'm going to ask you to do is just to, we're just going to sit in silence for a moment. And then I'm going to ask you to reflect on something in twos and threes. But let's just sit and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. So, we're going to hear some missional stories of what God is doing in and through our churches and our pioneers, uh, our ministers in training, our ministers, our ministries throughout our region. And it seemed appropriate to start off with a heart that all stories. So Fiona, if you'd like to come back. And uh, Fiona's going to tell us what's uh, been going on uh, through the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic uh, with Headland Baptist Church. This is a time I don't believe this. <laughs> I just put it in front of me. They don't want to be able to talk a lot. Um, so I suppose really our story with Headland Baptist Church about our missional work kind of like began just before Covid really. Um, we, um, and I, I think, still think that this has been the crux of everything, the backbone of everything that's happened and that we've done. And uh, we've set up a prayer meeting. Um, Wednesday morning, eight o'clock, um, we would all turn up. Well, there's about four or five of us. And at that time, when we started the prayer meeting, it was about looking at, because um, I kept getting back in prayer about make some noise outside. Um, so we, we started this prayer meeting, and um, five of us would turn up regularly every week, and we prayed for our youth groups, our um, fusion group, which was, um, I'm trying to find what it is, was lower in numbers on this, and we had, um, um, our luncheon club were kind of numbers a little bit lower than usual um, and we just started praying 
each of England can be asked for our church and for our community and for things that we could do. Um, so, praying each week, our fusion group numbers grew um, up to about 18, and then our um, luncheon club, um, the numbers started growing. Um, and then lockdown came, so it's a bit annoying, <laughs> to say the least. And uh, so, obviously, like all of us, we were kind of like all in a bit of disarray, weren't we? And thinking, oh my goodness me, what's going to happen now? Um, but we, we, st we still, uh, so I started, started a morning and evening prayer online um, with my dog snoring in the background. Um, so we, we started that, so we were still having the uh, prayer going. Um, but what we started to do as well was, um, we did the reimagine course as well, we started that just before the lockdown. And um, a, a session of that was where we kind of like were t together, like praying um, each churches in their own groups. And uh, and again, that thing about make some noise outside was really prevalent to us. Um, so um, so when lockdown came, we then we started really looking at stuff what we could uh, what we could do. So we did, we did things like um, we had a, we put a, a prayer well, we had a prayer wall so we, we've got like this wall and we just put um, tags there and things and encouraged about people like writing the prayers on the wall so we did a prayer wall we did a blessings tree at Christmas time that we had um, kind of hung up outside and people could put their blessings on but um, at the same time we also um, then started. Um, looking at things what we could do for the Easter time. So we worked ecumenically and we, we had an Easter trail going through our different churches. Um, and that was um, done, telling basically 14 stations of the cross ring, but in a modern up to date way. And it went from our church through to the St Hilda's church, through the other side to, uh, to St Mary's church, which is like a Catholic church. And it just told the whole Easter story. And there was uh, a book, the little booklets that had the pictures in and over a hundred of those books were taken which was amazing but at um, the Easter time when we could go um, when we could open for prayer we set up a thing called the sanctuary so over Easter that's the sanctuary so over um, from when we started that we've carried that on all the way through so that's been over 400 hours of prayer going on inside our church and um, that has just brought us so much food. We, um, we now have a thing called a bread and butter thing. And that's where um, people come and they get shopping. Um, now the idea of this, first of all, I was in a lecture at Cranmer and, um, oh, I'm really out of time. I was in a lecture at Cranmer and um, it was on about a food thing. And I just knew we had to get something going at Headland. And lo and behold, Jackie went for a walk and she bumped into a lady and it was just put on our laps. The bread and butter thing and so now we have people coming in each week as you can see the, um, the you know queuing outside and we've um we've had people we've been able to pray for people there uh, we've had one of the girls who once it comes to our church she's turned up for a service um so we've done that and we've worked ecumenically as well working with the um anglican church next door st hilda's which you probably all know um, and we would do it so they, like this Monday we did um, a service together and we were able to actually tell about being able to pray in our relationship with God to over 100 school kids. I mean how amazing is that? It's just brilliant. But the moment but we've had Slimming World come and use us now, we've just had so much stuff so actually now we've kind of gone full circle so about it started off about with making some noise outside but now we've actually got the outside making noise inside our church which is just unbelievable and it's just all down to prayer and God. And like what an amazing God. Thank you. Thank you for your enthusiasm and order. We're now going to take you uh, up to Gateshead and to Beacon Lodge Baptist Church. Hello, my name is Bob Adams and I'm the pastor of Beacon Loft Baptist Church here in Gateshead. As I record this, the church is on lockdown again as the result of high COVID rates in our area. And I guess this is going to be a picture of the future, learning to adapt and react to the national health situation. 
Of course, the past two years have been preparing us for a changing world. And Beacon Loft, like other Baptist churches, has changed the way that we do things. And we've benefited from the renewed focus, particularly on prayer. And of course, the coming to terms with technology. Throughout the pandemic, folk have been motivated to up their game and maintain contact with other people via letters and cards, by telephone and doorstep visits. And a number of us have really valued the chance to go walking with friends and contacts. And this has proved to be practical discipleship. Zoom, too, has been added value for meetings midweek, for Sunday coffee after the service, and I even conducted a baptismal class. Actually, on our first Sunday back in the building, we had a baptism, and it was such a great way to get started back in person. A real encouragement, though, has been our online service. We've been blessed with personnel with the skill set who can pull that together. And it's been great that the fellowship have been able to contribute as well. A surprise to us, however, was the attention that the service has gained as far afield as Spain and the United States, but also all over the UK. Now, one such connection I'd like to tell you about was a family contact of some local Christians here in Gateshead who now live in Bournemouth. Well, their church had closed and they were looking for a new place to worship. And because of the national lockdown, the internet became the go-to place. And so they watched one Sunday and then another and then another. They then passed on the service to others and now there's around 20 folks watching the service on a regular basis. What followed was a request for a Zoom communion. Well, things then developed so that I'd been able to offer some pastoral care and even another baptismal class. Now, during lockdown, these folks who now call themselves BLBC, that's the Beacon Loft Bournemouth crew, they joined in with our fellowship evenings. And now we continue to have shared prayer, and that's lovely. Once restrictions were lifted, whilst I was on sabbatical leave, my wife and I visited Bournemouth, and I was able to baptise three of their folk in the sea. Now, on a Sunday afternoon, these folk are meeting in a local hall for worship, watching the Beacon Loft service together. Now, the lesson here, I think, is that despite all the restrictions placed on us by a fallen world, there has to be a realisation that Jesus has designed his church to make its presence, its power and its culture known. But with a revolutionary caveat that gives us the upper hand in the face of circumstance, regardless of where that comes from. Every blessing. Tony is the moderator, pastor at Bishop Auckland, a number of our reimagined churches. And I know, Tony, that a few years ago, uh, if you visited the church or tried to get to the church during the week, uh, you would have found a locked building, an empty building, and that there were many people in the community who thought that Bishop Auckland Baptist Church had actually closed and wasn't doing anything anymore. Uh, but nowadays, particularly on a Wednesday, if you were to uh, go down to Bishop Auckland Baptist Church, you would find the building alive with all kinds of activities, all kinds of things going on, lots of people coming and going, uh, and a real hive of missional activity. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that journey, Tony, and, and how has it come to be uh, from a closed, empty building to one where there's lots going on? Well, as has been mentioned before, our journey, in a sense, started with Reimagine. Um, we were challenged on that first weekend as to how we were going to contact our community in the 21st century. Well, we haven't really entered the 21st century, we're still in the 20th, or <laughs> dare we say the 19th. <laughs> um, but since then we've amended that to how can we help our community today. And uh, the first thing we did, which has already been mentioned this morning, is on a Sunday morning, we said, why are we having coffee and tea in the back, hidden away, when we're on the main road? So, we went out the front door and had tea and coffee outside. Took a few chairs out and invited anybody that was passing to join us. And one or two did. Most were busy going on their way to the pub or the bookies or the shop, uh, but some did. And in fact, there's one guy who now wanders in on a Sunday morning, part way through, 
to come and listen to whatever part of the service uh, he, he's got he got left. So we usually put the sermon at the end so he gets the sermon. <laughs> um, so that sort of started us thinking. And um, we realised that the things we're short of are people and money. We have a big building that perhaps holds, what, 200? Uh, we have six members. Uh, we have a, a piece of ground beside the, be, beside the building that separates us from the hospital, which was at best neglected. Um, we started a gardening group. We got together with some guys who, whose lives had been ruined, who were being put, put back together, who had an allotment. And we said, you come and have, you come and look after our garden on a Wednesday morning and we'll give you a hot lunch. Well, they liked that idea. Uh, our garden recently got a Northumbria in Bloom award, as well as being uh, very much e incredible edible involved as well. Uh, and our, so what happens on Wednesday? Well, our cooking team arrives about between seven and half past and sets about cooking. Our other volunteers arrive about nine-ish, so I'm told, I never get there that early. <coughs> well, I do have a 30 mile commute. Um, and uh, one lady, what with one lady set, who sets up a large, large table with food to give away, that, that which we've collected, which we're not using in the kitchen, um, and others. And <coughs> my job is just to sit and talk to the folk that come in. The other week I was sat talking to a couple of bikers. You could tell they were bikers because they were dressed appropriately. <laughs> Although it has to be said that one had turned up on his, uh, in, in his, on his, uh, wheel, with his wheelchair because he had obviously suffered. And both were ex-military. And there's all sorts of people that come in on a, on a Wednesday morning that we sit and talk to and listen to their stories. And if necessary, we, we, we find ways where we can uh, point them to uh, places where they need to go. I think sometimes on a Wednesday, we serve between 50 and 60 meals on a Wednesday. When lockdown came, we were struggling. We closed for all of, oh, I think a week or a fortnight. And then we realized that we could still serve lunches as long as we served them as takeaways. Folk could come and take. And so that continued. And uh, the building on a Wednesday, as you say, is a, is a hive of activity. There's lots of people coming, and gradually, there's been just the beginnings of one or two folk coming on the Sunday. Not necessarily the people that we've been helping, but people who've had some connection with the church that's disappeared, and have now said, oh, there's something happening. Perhaps we ought to become part of it. So we're growing both on a Wednesday and, uh, and on a Sunday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Let's give you a Hello, MBA family. Um, I'm Stephen, the minister at Colby New Baptist Church. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you today, but we're actually travelling somewhere else today. But I hope you are having an incredible time of gathering and listening to God's voice together. Uh, Paul just asked me to record a short video uh, telling you a bit of stories about uh, the pandemic and Colby Newham here in South Middlesbrough and how it's uh, worked out for us. Um, we've got a couple, of, a couple of really good stories that have worked out. But before I tell you that, um, just to frame this in the fact that the pandemic has been really hard as well. It's been, um, in fact, it's been pretty brutal. We've had one of those pandemics where we've had, uh, we've had death and cancer 
and mental health problems and we've had people leaving um, church as well and uh, there's there's been um, it's been a pretty brutal couple of years actually so it's not all been wonderful uh, but there has been uh, some amazing mission that's happened incredible move of the spirit as well um, but during the pandemic as we moved online and uh, transferred things into zoom and stuff uh, we we really seem to catch a wave of something with what the Holy Spirit was doing, particularly with um, online alphas. We ran three online alphas over the past 18 months, and each one has been the most successful alpha that we've had. They've been beautiful, incredible. We've had people who never would have gone to a church building to gather for an alpha course have uh, gathered together online in from their own homes and have felt safe and secure to share um, relationships developed really easily. The videos were powerful. Uh, discussion times were great. Even when we did like the Holy Spirit um, sessions where we spent just time some pr praying and worshipping over Zoom, the Holy Spirit showed up. There were powerful moments where people just felt convicted to give their lives. Uh, and we've had some baptisms since then as well. So um, beautiful, amazing. Um, and then when the kind of restrictions lifted, um, the best thing that we did by a long shot was we moved our services outside. So from April until very recently, we've had a good 90% of our services outside. Um, we're lucky that we've got a we've got an area of a, a nice little public square just outside our building. And we we've been setting up out there instead. And what it did was it meant that uh, that straight away all of our people came back because there was no reason to not come back. Some of them for the first couple of weeks sat in their cars, but then they felt very comfortable and came um, uh, and got out of their cars and just gathered together. Um, and so we managed to gather the church family again quite early on as soon as the restrictions lifted. Uh, and that was beautiful and it felt wonderful. Um, but then what we noticed was it had a huge missional potential as well, is uh, people from our local community were hearing us singing worship. Uh, the houses around us were hearing us singing. People started coming down. Walkers by started pausing. And um, amazingly, the church started growing from this. I wish we'd moved outside years ago. Um, turns out it's the secret to a missional service is just moving it out of the building to um, the street. And uh, uh, we've probably grown, our Sundays have probably grown by about 50% from what they were pre-pandemic levels, um, which is definitely the fastest growth that we've seen since I've been here about 11 years and uh, haven't seen that sort of growth before. And it seemed to come from um, being outside. The live stream of the service as well was really effective is because what we were finding was people were showing up to these outdoor services um, when perhaps they would feel nervous about going inside. Um, but they, they, they were saying to us, oh, we've actually been watching you for two or three weeks on the live stream. And then they were rocking up and uh, felt like they knew us. And it, it felt like the online live stream had been providing a bridge that we hadn't had before, a bridge to that, the big decision to go to church on that Sunday. It felt like it, it made it less of a less of a big difference for people. And uh, and so far we, we've kept them. We've just been back inside uh, for the last few weeks since the weather's turned and it hasn't been that great. And yeah pe people are hanging around they're staying um uh, and i hope they do i really hope they do so pray for us pray that people stay but at the moment we've got a number of new christians that we're discipling some people we're talking about baptism with uh, and we've got a bunch uh, who have been with us uh, for new people for the last 18 months or so through different things who we're talking about membership with as well so um there's been hardship it's been tough it's been brutal in so many ways uh, but we are really thankful for what God has been doing uh, in the midst of all of that messiness. Um, so hope the story encourages you, praying for all of you, pray that God is blessing you and in amongst all the difficulty, you are spotting him at work. God bless you from all of us at Colby Newham and Middlesbrough. Have a great afternoon. Bye bye. And, uh, and Karen's based uh, at Annick Baptist Church. Uh, and so first of all, Karen, well, how, how is the training going so far? One, one month or so in? Um, I just my first essay last week, so excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent, well that's a good start, yeah. Uh, we do need some remember in prayer on this as in training. It's a full on uh, uh, commitment. Uh, there's a lot involved, there's a lot of demands, uh, but there's lots of opportunities and colleagues at work uh, through our training uh, with, in partnership with Northern Baptist College in Cranwell Hall.
So you're based in Annick, and uh, tell us a bit about the, the mission work that you have been involved in uh, as, as a member of the church, but also going into prisons with uh, Junction 42. Um, so I'm part of ABC Anabaptist Church, and uh, we have lots of touching places um, in Annick. Um, there's My Yerkes, there's Cap, there's the Food Bank, there's, there's so many I've had to write them down and now I can't read them. <laughs> um, but one that I've mostly been involved in is Beaver's Court, and that's um, like an assisted living uh, place. We've had the opportunity to go in there and just run sort of informal Bible study um, called Faith Talks. Um, we've done songs of praise and remembering the services. Um, but really it's just a place where we just get to come alongside the folks and just hang out with them, speak to them and be with them where they're at. Um, and it's been a real privilege. And on Thursday we were able to go back after lockdown um, and just spend time with them. And, and it's just really precious, but I think it's made us realise, it's made me realise how much time we've lost with those folks over the pandemic by not being able to go in. Um, we were still sort of sending bits and pieces in and like little packs. Um, and we did like, we sent in like little poppy seeds for Remembrance Day last year. Um, but our time there is really precious with them. And uh, yeah, so we'll hope to continue doing some stuff in there with them and services and that. And that's a missional community that's that started alongside the church. You're not trying to get people into proper church. It, it is church in its own right. It is a lot of yeah. in, in, in this uh, retirement uh, complex. Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about the prison work that you've been involved in um, when you were able to go into prison before uh, the pandemic hit and uh, uh, made it more difficult. Um, so I work for an organisation called Junction 42 and we work in prisons in the North East and we work with people when they, when they get out of prison as well. Um, we got pulled out of prison quite quickly when the pandemic hit and um, there was obviously no uh, faith provision and so our organisation um, made up faith packs and sent them into the prisons and we sent them into every prison in England and Scotland um, which had like CDs in, worship CDs, prayer and uh, journals and an interactive um, activity so like stitching a um, cross, um, uh, some colouring activities with scriptures um, so in total the organisation has delivered about 120,000 packs across our prisons. Um, and then when we were allowed back in prison, but no face-to-face, -face, we could phone, like, phone the lads in North England. We were running alpha courses. Um, and over the pandemic, we saw seven men give their life to Jesus. Um, and, and this week again, yesterday, um, we are now back, and we're able to do face-to-face -face alpha courses, um, which has been brilliant. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether you have any sense of where God is leading you in, in mission in the, uh, the months to come as you have this kind of missional placement as a, a pioneer minister um, out of Anic Baptist Church in your training. Anything you sense that God is going to open up for you as you move forward? Oh, I was going to say I have no idea. <laughs> um, and to expect the unexpected. That's what I feel like God's laid on my heart. Um, but especially in, in both communities in the prison and in our Weaver's Court community, what really strikes me is the loneliness. And uh, I feel that that's something that God's really laid on my heart, is the loneliness, and especially that's something that's been highlighted over the pandemic. Um, so I'm not quite sure what that is or where that's leading to, but that's, that's what I feel that God's laid on my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And I just sense, and I'm sure you sense, as we've, we've heard Karen's story and other stories, that, that willingness to go on a bit of an adventure, uh, to take a first step, and as you say, you don't know where it's going to lead, uh, but if we take that first step, then that's when God meets us and, and opens up the next step and the next step. And can I just say, Karen, it's been nice to see you in three dimensions, so this is the first time, and we've seen five images on screens over the last uh, year or so, but it's great to, to see you in the flesh, as it were. So thank you very much to Karen. That's good, Karen. I'm Steve Cowie, I'm the pastor at New Life Baptist Church in North Arlington. One of the most exciting ventures that we've been involved in in recent years here in North Allerton is the setting up of the Living Rooms. The Living Rooms is a charity of which the trustees are from the leading churches in our town. I'm the chair and was the pioneer of this new ministry. When Jesus said that we are the light of the world, 
and that we should let our light shine that others could see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. I wonder what he really meant. Where does mission really take place? It takes place outside of the doors of our churches, in our communities, in our neighbourhoods. And the living rooms were set up um, as an outcome of a number of ministries that were developed at New Life over the last few years, working with those in need in our community, those with mental health problems, drug and alcohol problems. We helped set up a local food bank, we uh, initiated the setting of street angels, and we've resourced our time in creating relationships with the community, with the police, with the uh, local mental health services, with our uh, councils, both local uh, and county councils, with our housing associations, with our social services. And about four years ago, I had this vision of setting something up outside of the building, our church building, but in partnership with the other churches. In North Allerton, we have some fantastic relationships with the other major churches in town, and we regularly meet and do things together. And so when I had the idea of the living rooms, it was that we would be a community hub in the centre of North Allerton, outside of our church building. There would be a place that people could come and be ministered to. That developed into um, the living rooms being a collaborative venture with the other churches in town. So our charity is set up in such a way as the other leading churches are all trustees. So it's not a New Life Baptist Church venture now, it's a Churches Together venture. We call our Churches Together in North Allerton, one North Allerton, uh, to evidence the fact that we're working in unity. At the core of the living rooms is a mental health wellbeing cafe modelled on Renew Wellbeing, an initiative set up about five years ago by Ruth Rice at uh, another New Life Baptist Church in Nottingham. And so people come into our building, which is a, a refurbished carpet flooring uh, shop in the, right in the centre of North Allerton, uh, where we have offices upstairs. I mean, that one of those offices, our boardroom now. And people come in and they have talk coffee and tea and have conversations in the living rooms. We've set it out as a living room with a lovely kitchen that we've spent £25,000 refurbishing this property. So it really is a beautiful place to be. People come in, there's a kitchen table, they sit around, they do crafts, there's different crafts taking place each day. Because we use the five ways to well-being that are recommended by the NHS. So people are doing things and sharing their lives. Largely people who have issues with their well-being. At the heart of the Renew model is prayer. And so we've created a prayer room in the centre of this building, or the not in the physically in the centre, but at the centre of our activities, where at the end of every session there's a time of prayer and people are invited to come into that. It's a, it's a more formal prayer, but a prayer based on scripture that people can engage with. In these premises are also based the Hamilton Food Chair, our food bank. We also have links with our own Jubilee Debt Advice. and We have strong links with the NHS and local services. What we're doing here is letting our light shine, but not just as a church, but as the church, the church in North Allerton, the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church, the United Reformed Church, the Methodist Church and ourselves. And when I started this initiative that was launched just before COVID two years ago, um, I got the church leaders together and I managed to raise money through them. And as soon as the, the, the community knew what was happening, I, was, I found it easy to raise the money that was necessary to get this project off the ground. Within no time I had £70,000 to be able to refurbish this property and to get this underway. We've had gr grants and money given to us from the Police and Crime Commissioner, from our council, uh, from other local charities. And when we opened this building in December 19, it was opened with a great fanfare uh, with our chairman of our local council opening it and we were on the pages of the local papers. We even had BBC Radio York coming down to talk about what we were doing. Mental health, poor mental health, well-being is a key issue for our society. And we believe that through the actions of Christians bearing the name of Jesus, um, that we can bring hope to our community. 
We're not overtly evangelising during the daytime, but through our actions and through prayer, we are building bridges to our community. Right off opposite where I am now as a, as a row of shops, and we have wonderful relationships with those shops now. The door is opened into that community where we can go and, and, and share our faith and talk about why we do these things. We have fantastic relationships with the police. The NHS are now wanting us to commission, to actually pay for us to run some additional services, such as our credibility. We're letting our light shine before others so they may see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. That's what The Living Rooms is all about. And if you want to know more, please contact me. Our website is currently under reconstruction, but you can contact me through a New Life Baptist Church. That's nlbc.org.uk. I'd be happy to show you around and let you see what God is doing in North Arlton through this wonderful initiative. The Bible tells us that where brothers and sisters dwell together in unity, there God commands the blessing. And I believe we have been abundantly blessed in lots of ways, not least of all with finance, despite the difficult times that we're in. And I believe that that's because God has blessed us by our working together in unity with the other churches in town. God bless you. Hello, I'm Rachel from New Life Baptist Church in North Allerton. And I'd like to share with you what we've been doing um, with our community and with the other churches in the town. So back in February, we started a group called One North Allerton, One Planet. So our Churches Together group is called One North Allerton and the strap line is um, Church and Community Together. And this climate project is very much about that. So um, we started off with a couple of reps from each church and discussing what we were going to do. We used the um, Climate Emergency Toolkit, which um, I had through Tier Fund, but others had through Christian Aid and different other green organisations. Um, and we used that to actually try and engage with our congregations and with our leadership to talk about climate change and how we as a Christian community should respond to that. Um, and we ended up doing um, a declaration of a climate emergency on um, the Climate Sunday at the beginning of September. And three of the five churches did that. And a fourth church also had a Climate Sunday service um, at a slightly different time. Um, but we got everybody on board um, and engaging with that, which was great. Um, and since then, we've done some different community events after the Climate Sunday service, we had a picnic in the park, which was the first time a lot of people had got together post-COVID. Um, and then following that, we had a, um, the Young Christians Climate Network people on their relay from the G7 to the COP26 um, going through North Allerton. So we did a meet and greet with them. Um, here are some pictures to show you. They were actually cycling, not walking for our stretch. And we also did a, an event in the town hall, um, that was just a couple of weekends ago, um, to just try and engage with our community and to um, just yeah, get involved with other groups that have like green ideals. So we got the um, North Allerton Rotters and the Hamilton Wombles, Warm and Well that do home insulation and energy saving tips, um, a toy lending library, um, to try and reduce the amount of plastic we all buy and all sorts of things like that. And it was fantastic to get different people from the community um, joining together in one event. Um, we had lots of activities for the children to make it fun um, and a lot of interest. And leading on from that, um, we also are going to present a petition um, to Rishi Sunak um, so here's the petition that we've been getting, collecting signatures, over 200 signatures we've got about climate justice and climate finance. Um, so a group are going to see him next week. And we've also um, just started a conversation with some of the other groups in the town about going bigger and having perhaps um, a big umbrella organisation, which is bigger than us, um, which will be like a North Allerton environment group possibly associated with um, Friends of the Earth. Um, that's all up for discussion. But what started as a small little project within the churches has now become um, a big 
um, community-wide um, thing within Northallerton, and it's been great to be um, part of the catalyst that set that going, and I really feel that that's God at work using his church within the community to make a difference. I hope that inspires you all. Thanks. So that brings us to the end of our visual stories. And I'll just share a, a last thought, picking up on what Hayley said earlier. Uh, God invites us, Jesus invites us to join the adventure of mission. Uh, and the challenge that I feel, and maybe you felt of it this morning, is if there's no adventure in your life at the moment, if there's nothing that's taking you out of the comfortable place into a slightly less comfortable place, if, if you're just uh, doing the same thing again and again each day, each week, but there's no adventure there, then I think the challenge is, are you really listening to Jesus and are you following Jesus? Because if we are followers of Jesus, there's always got to be some adventure in our lives. There's got to be something that takes us out of the familiar into the unfamiliar. Doing the kinds of things that we've heard in these mission stories. So you might want to ponder that. I uh, shared in my group uh, a little experience that uh, we've moved my wife and I back home to Northumberland's. We've gone to Annick, and uh, we are intending to be part of Annick Baptist Church. They have one of my pastors here and another training for ministry. And uh, there was an opportunity a few weeks ago to attend Sunday morning service for the first time since we had returned to Annick. But my neighbours invited me to join them to have a coffee at the breakfast table in their garden. And so I went, and the presence of Jesus was there in the conversation. And all the time I was thinking, but in half an hour I should be making my way to a church service. But I stayed with where Jesus was, in the conversation at the meal table and saw the kingdom of God at work among people who wouldn't come across the doors of our church services or our church buildings. They didn't teach me at Bible college how to bless a pigeon loft, but I've been doing that recently because I'm engaging with what would be once described as working class, ordinary northern blokes who happen to be tradesmen, some of whom have become friends. We've shared life and faith together. They've had more vulnerability, more generosity, more commitment, more sharing life with one another than I've seen in many a church. And it's been my privilege to see the Spirit of God at work in the community that again wouldn't come over the threshold of any of our church buildings. What have I been doing with them? Giving out tracts, telling them about John 3.16 and Romans 3.23? No, I've just been sharing life with them and listening to what the Spirit of God is doing in their lives. And that's how the invitation came to accompany them at blooming five o'clock in the morning <laughs> to go down and bless a pigeon loft and also to help with three of the seven guys with mental health issues. Huge issues. I'm going to invite um, Dan Holland, uh, who's part of the leadership team at Portrack, and, uh, and Heather O'Neill, who's part of the eldership at Heaton, to come and join me now. Uh, we're not experts in any way, but we want to just kind of take from uh, the floor, as it were, the questions and the issues that we all wrestle with about joining with God in what God is doing in the neighbourhood. So, so Heather and, uh, and Dan, do you want to come and join me now? Different perspectives. I thought it was quite good to not have people who are either trustees, governors, or official NBA ministers, but actually just folks who just join God in mission. Have, have a seat, folks. I think you can have a seat and a microphone. There we go. It's <laughs> good. It is, somebody once described, uh, part of my role in doing some work with the Baptist Union is working with pioneers right across, you know, our, our Baptist Together movement. And uh, one of the things that we, we're kind of discovering is that lockdown did lock us out of our buildings. It was like, I, I'm trying to, I taught a few months ago my, my, one of my grandchildren how to ride a bike. And it meant they came to that stage where the stabilizers had to come off. And it was a bit scary for them. But they discovered once the stabilizers were off, they could go wherever they wanted to go. They could go on rough ground. They could just do their own thing and go on an adventure. And I think in many ways what God did in lockdown was he removed the stabilizers from our churches. And for many churches, our stabilizers were our church buildings and our Sunday services. And like Hamish just said, well, the Spirit of God was still at work outside of those things. Now, don't hear me wrong, Sunday services are good and buildings can be useful if we use them for the purposes of the kingdom and 
not just for ourselves. But it's actually discovering what God's doing in the neighbourhood. Uh, Dan, do you just want to share with us a little bit about what you've been doing in Portrack? Joining God in the neighbourhood and the missional adventure? Yeah, thanks Roy. Um, so I'm the youth and community worker at Portrack. Uh, the community bit of that kind of came around through lockdown. Um, I kind of stopped doing my youth club kind of routine for the first time in about 15 years. Kind of felt a bit stuck. Um, and I got in touch with a local school, just said, well, I'm here, how can I help? Uh, and then I was invited into the school to kind of help and we ended up giving out about 2,000 pack lunches to various children who couldn't come into the school during lockdown. Uh, and we had a whole team of people serving the school, getting involved, just in and about the community. And I kind of was struck really that, you know what, God was already at work in and amongst the school and the staff, amongst the head teacher with a heart and compassion for the area of the community. And there was me thinking that I had to kind of make what God was doing happen in the building and in what I was doing because I was the paid youth worker. And I've just been really struck, I mentioned it in my brief little bit about, um, you know, Jesus spent so much time getting invited and yet we spent so much of our time inviting others. And so I'm trying to be flipping in that. And again, because I was involved, because I was helping, I was invited to be governor in the school and be involved in that way. And I'm still working through what that means to be invited. My wife has just been kind of commissioned and ordained as a minister, and she's a community minister. So we're we're starting a a missional community on the estate. And so we are are trying to get invited into people's homes and trying to kind of gather around people and meet with people and just have these conversations and develop relationships as we know. But it's just something in that question of how do I get invited? Uh, God is a question of where do I see God at work. I've found over lockdown particularly that God is at work wherever I notice him. He is always at work. We, we don't have an ownership of what God is doing in the church. So we know that, excuse me. But I've just been really challenged and struck as I meet with community groups, as I get more involved with the community, I can usually see something of the heart of God in that person. They don't know it yet, but it's almost like I can come in and I can point it out to them almost, that God is at work in these places and these spaces. I just need to jump in and get involved. And so that's what I'm trying to do in this kind of slightly new role. That's great. And that whole theme of, of learning to be the, the guest mm. rather than being the host is a really big thing that people uh, are discovering in lockdown. In morning prayer in uh, Northumbria community, we say, Be in the heart, Lord, of each to whom I speak, and in the mouth of each who speaks unto me. It's just actually the realizing that, that God's at work in, in relationships in the world. Heather? Yeah. Um, so, um, I guess, is it over lockdown you want me to talk about? Yeah, go on. Okay. Or, well, I guess we're... Generally. Generally, okay, generally. Well, I guess where it kind of suppose started things changed for me was I went to Bangladesh and worked there for a year, about 10 years ago, and came back and was, I suppose, suffering with reverse culture shock. Um, and... Um, was really looking forward to getting back into church because I hadn't been to a church for a year and came back and having been for a year very culturally sensitive to what was going on around me, came back into church and thought, what are we doing here? This is not relevant to the culture that I'm in. And certainly I started a new job with new people who didn't know me and it just felt so bizarre. It's something that I'm really familiar with um, and have felt very comfortable, but also just thought there's I couldn't invite anybody to this. This is just so different. And I guess over the last ten years then I've been looking at um how do we um you know um share God with the people that we interact with every day. Um I am an activist, I do tend to get involved in lots of things. I have a tendency to want to really help those on the fringes, people who are I suppose less privileged and less in not in positions of power um, and I have a real heart for people from other countries, from refugees, asylum seekers and I am very involved in that um, but I think the change for me probably is what Dan said too is recognising that God is at work in other people's lives and there's lots of other things going on out there in the community um, which we've all heard about but that aren't always church based but actually there's goodness in the people around us and God's at work in them too and recognising God at work in their lives and I guess giving them the space and the time to tell their story and to share their story with me so that I can have the privilege of sharing my story with them Um, and I guess one thing that I did learn from Bangladesh which I don't always put into practice is time giving people your time is the biggest gift that you can give to anybody Um, and that's what I 
learn from my friendships with people from another country. They're very good at that, people from different cultures, um, and I've been blessed by that. Um, so, so rather than feeling burdened um, by feeling like I always need to be sharing something or telling people about Jesus, actually it's earning the right to maybe um, share my life with them and and in that, that I listen to their story um, and what they think about God and or maybe what they don't think about God but um, in that way that we can share the love of Jesus with people and sometimes that will be practical um, but sometimes that is just in yeah, I guess, being, yes, being, yeah. That's great, thank you, thank you. Um, we just want to give an opportunity now for people to, to ask questions, to share their own experiences, um, and, and, you know, to identify with some of those. I mean, how many, how many people like Heather and I have kind of got friends outside the church, but we would really struggle to bring people into our church programs and services. Is, is there anybody other than Heather and I who have that issue, right? That is, that's not a condemnation of church, it's just that it's a different culture. The, the guys who've become friends who are working class blokes, uh, who I have nothing in common with, apart from a love of football, well, not really a love of football, but we're Newcastle and Middlesbrough fans, but it's like, you know, but the culture of church and the program of church is so alien to them. And I think often our methods of evangelism and mission in the past has been us needing to share God's story and to share our story and testimony. But perhaps what we're le learning at the moment is to listen to other people's stories, to listen to where people are at. And, and that's, for me, is the whole challenge of the John 1, 14. Jesus, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and, and, and was, the, was the guest in people's lives. Anybody got any questions? We're, we're, we're not experts. We're a bit like C.S. Lewis who said, um, please just regard me as somebody who's been around the hospital ward a bit longer than most other people, so I can advise one or two new patients. Uh, I, I'm an old man now. Um, I, I don't feel old. Well, I did this morning. But I don't feel particularly old, but according to my grandchildren, I'm, I'm ancient. Uh, but I can share a few things, and these guys have got experience about sharing the generation. Any questions from the floor? about how we join this mission adventure. Mike. You just mentioned that the, um, we live in a different culture now. Um, and you say that, that the culture of the church doesn't relate to the culture which we are in. What is the answer to the culture that we're in now? Did everybody hear that question? Okay, we're living in a different time. The world is changing. And actually, Mike, it's a really complex question as well as a complex answer, because there is no one culture. We now live in an absolute smorgasbord of all kinds of cultures. I still believe, and I think what we're being called to do, is to rediscover our confidence in the power of the gospel. Mm -hmm. That Jesus has the power to transform for good people's lives. I, I think, I, for me, it's not a dilution of the gospel, but it's actually, we have a lot to learn about how to communicate faith in these days. Um, because actually, the words that I use when I traditionally would share the gospel as a young Christian mean absolutely nothing. It's not heard by people today because it's a culture removed from them. Jesus went around, and it's in Mark's gospel, they said the ordinary people heard him gladly. Now the guys that I've been mixing with over the last couple of months are not hearing Jesus gladly, but it doesn't diminish the power of the gospel to bring transformation to people's lives. In asking a question, I think we need to listen a lot more um, because in listening we discern and in discerning we discover what God is doing. I've discovered a community, a solidarity among a group of guys in Amic that I sense is where the Spirit of God is at work in the world. People who do actually care about life and one another and, and it's how I communicate faith into that context not imposing my religion. I think a lot of proclamation is about, we've got the truth, we're gonna tell you what it is, and your life's gonna be changed. Uh, I think that's arrogance. I think we, we work with where the Spirit of God is at work. And he will draw people to himself. You lift up Jesus, he will draw people to himself. I don't know if you guys wanna share anything in answer to that very complex question. I think listening is really important. One thing we found during lockdown was that we didn't have anywhere to go. So we weren't rushing anywhere. 
And so we just spent time with our neighbours that we would never before done. And so instead of dashing, you know, rushing out of church, see people, right, hi, goodbye, we actually just spent time chatting with people. And you hear something of the story, you get to know the relationship with people. And actually, I could see that there's, there's a, not just that you're looking for opportunities, but there's a way of engaging and there's a relationship and a, and a kind of stuff in common that we've never have found because my wife and I both engaged in the church and so busy doing things. But having that chance to actually just stop and have like kind of margins in our time that we were able to just have facilitate those conversations and get to know people and get, you know, that our, our street held a, a party for, I forget what it was, it was the Queen's Jubilee or something. Uh, and so the whole street was locked down, they'd organised everything, they'd set it up and they were facilitating food and drinks and relationships and get the whole community together. And yet you, you kind of miss this stuff because it's obviously doing our thing mm-hmm. rather than seeing actually there's a God thing happening right outside our front door. And so I, I think listening is really important, listening to God, being out in the community and also listening to people and kind of somehow bringing those things together. And, and, and re- I mean, responding to the prompts of the Holy Spirit when God gives you things. Yesterday, our plumber came back for just a kind of five-minute job, but 40 minutes later, we left our house. And, and, and I didn't give him the gospel, but actually, what I heard was a guy that was really struggling with his mental health. So I was able to say, actually, do you know what? God really loves you, Malcolm. He really cares for you. And the guy starts to break down and cry. And then practically, I get him a counsellor which actually, if you're looking for a counsellor, that's a miracle that I managed to get a counsellor within eight hours. But, but it, it's not us having to strive in order to witness. It's actually just listening, discerning, being there, being the Christ person in that particular situation. Um, and, 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 folks, it's fun. I, I am enjoying being a witness for Jesus Christ. Um, in, in a way that often I haven't, I felt obligated to be a witness for Jesus Christ. But actually, when you join with the adventure of God, it's life-giving. It's life-giving. When you start to strive, and when you're not on an adventure, you need to be asking the question, I, I, I've got my barometer set in the wrong way. Uh, I need to be joining with God in community. Heather, I don't know if you want to say anything. I suppose just that I think in the past certainly you know our, our ultimate goal often is getting people over the threshold of the church because then we feel that we'll be in somewhere where they can hear about Jesus and, um, and actually the majority of people probably will never do that um, but that's still okay because you are where you are and you can share Jesus with them and, and that might look like all sorts of different their collections of missional communities or coffee groups, it might be that they come to something like a gardening group in your church and that's where um, they hear about Jesus and that's maybe where they'll just stay and that's okay. So I suppose that's the other thing that's changed too, um, for me anyway. And it, it's so encouraging, I mean Karen was sharing this morning about the experience of the missional community at Weaver's Court, uh, south of Anik. Uh, you know, and I think you said didn't you, it's not, Paul, it's not about inviting people to the church service. It's actually about letting the gospel impact people's lives where they are, and the missional community, church if you like, is formed in that culture. And I think like, that's how you address the different cultures. You actually allow the good news to penetrate all those different cultures. So for some people it might be, I mean these guys are not going to gather on a Sunday morning in church service, but it might be that actually we might do something together on a Sunday morning if I can get myself up at five o'clock. Uh, <laughs> Missional communities emerge, you've got, you've got groups meeting in, in pubs and clubs, you've got people in walking, you've got the environment, you've got beachcomber cafes, you've got surf clubs. It's, it's actually taking the good news and believing in the power of the good news to transform people's lives without them having to come and visit a foreign country, a thing called a church service, as we know it. Other questions? Where we were asked to park this morning. <laughs> yes. Now, luckily, I don't think there's any complaints because sometimes there's a neighbor that just complains if you park outside the house. But that, what I'm trying to say is, I think we uh, about 40 years, I've lived in Caledonia and Rome about 45 years. Now, I'm going back 40 years and in the 70s now. So we've done all this evangelizing, we've knocked on doors, we did camera service, but it's getting people in from this area. And um, how do we, I mean, we've got crack groups going on, reading groups going on. 
from just the computers. Now people are coming from Oxford Road area and maybe to use the computers. Um, they may be not for what they're supposed to be used for, but they're coming. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to say. And then get to say hello and goodbye to them. Um, we have, I know, I know it's kind of unfair. Do we go back over and do the things that we've always done? Um, it's kind of funny, so we haven't got these caps that you're running about. Um, Cyber caps, do you call them? We haven't got anything like that, but we've got, um, like where you're lucky, I think at the moment we've only got one pastor in the market, the Baptist pastor. There are Catholic pastors, uh, priests. Uh, um, and they have a lot of churches or priests. Mm -hmm. But what do we do um, as a community? Can I suggest that you uh, bless you for your efforts and endeavours to bring people into the church building? I actually think most of those efforts and energies will not produce people coming into your church building. And you've actually shared testimony of 45 years, it hasn't worked. I think it's time that we took a real serious rethink and say, actually, we're not going to get those people into church buildings. Jesus' great commission was to go into all the world. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 was not go out and invite them to come into a church building, but to go. Now, that's a whole different ball game. It's a whole different ball game. And I'm not undermining any of the work that you're doing because some people's lives would have been impacted by bringing them into this context. But to reach the 90% of the people in Britain today, whether you be Hartlepool, North Allerton, Annick, they're not going to come across the threshold of our church buildings. So that requires a huge reorientation of how we live for Jesus. And actually, you mentioned about pastors and priests and that lot. Actually, ministry is going to change and is changing, thank God, in the years to come. I think we've unconsciously disempowered the people of God by creating professional ministers, by creating people and saying, we'll wait till we get the next minister. We'll wait till we get somebody else who will come and lead us and guide us and shepherd us. Actually, Declaration of Principle, Baptist President to come. The third Declaration of Principle is we are all called to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. And actually for me, ministry now is about empowering people to be witnesses for Jesus in Caledonia Road, listening to what God is doing in that community. Uh, you were talking about the, the, the lass who's living next door to you. That's, is that an outer manner? Yeah. I mean, her worldview is so different. So it's about learning to listen to what Jesus is doing in her life and in that street and responding appropriately. And the vast majority of people are not gonna come over our thresholds. So it, it's a huge, it's what Haley was talking about this morning. You know, well, we've done this. We've done door-to-door -door evangelism. We've preached the gospel. We've brought people into the sound of the gospel. You know, we've sung our hymns. We've had our good worship. So we've got PA systems. We've got a PowerPoint. We've got Keynote if we're into Apple Mac. We've got all these things. But actually, it's like the experience of fishing. Are we prepared to unlearn as well as learn? I think that's quite a challenge, particularly if our default position is just to do church the way we've always done church. But, but... Every statistic in the world will tell us if we keep doing what we keep doing, we will continue to decline massively. Uh, Ashley, you were talking about Steve Ainsworth, but rewilding the church. Mm -hmm. um, I come from an agricultural area and uh, in Northumberland now. Did you know that ploughing is regarded as one of the most damaging things for the environment? That ploughing, with all the invention of the ploughshare and everything else was the way to get farming and going and keep the industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution before. Ploughing is seen to be so destructive because it's actually damaging the environment. And I think it's time for us to stop ploughing the way we've been doing church and start to learn how to, to be open to what God wants to do in our day and generation in different ways. Sorry, that's the Geordie coming out of me. I can just talk for ages. But um, others, any comments on, on that, that experience? Because most churches would share your experience. Most churches would share your experience. Uh, Oxford Road is not unique to that. I guess what I hear in you is a desire to um, share Jesus with other people. And I think 
that's great and I think you know like the Holy Spirit lives in you and just to to validate you I suppose in that you know you're you you have got relationships around you with your neighbours with your friends or family and you're taking Jesus to them too and I think I guess it's just a shift sometimes in focus of actually you're really important in that and it doesn't have to be about them coming into the building um, and sometimes that just changes your view and, and what you do every day and who you interact with and it's how it's changed for me I suppose really it, it might be different for other people but you know just um, that you you are salt and light wherever you go um, and it's just and you go into lots of different places that I won't ever go to and a lot of other people here won't ever go to and that's really important um, to reach those people that way Let's say again, if you say you've lived here 45 years, that's 45 years, well, 40 years, 45 years worth of your witness and who you are. There's something in you that is of God that is in this place that is unique to you that no one else can do because you are you. And so just to encourage you and to encourage us, I guess, that we talk about um, it's God's mission that we get to be involved with. Um, and so you're involved in God's mission on Caledonian Road or Caledonian Street. Okay, so the pressure isn't on you because it's God's mission that we just jump in with. It's not a thing that's down to us, as I think Hilary said, that, that we are kind of invited to participate in his mission. And I guess one thing I would perhaps suggest is just to be, as you walk into and from church on Sunday, whatever you're doing during the week, just be praying and just saying, God, what is it that you're doing in this place? And how can I be involved with it? But be encouraged, you're already witnessing people who see something in you because God is in you. Um, so don't think that, that it's not worked. It just might not work in the way that we might be expecting it to. But God is already doing something, so just keep going. And be encouraged, I think, all the great things that is happening in the church as well. You you are a presence of Christ in your in your street and in your neighborhood. And and all the care and, and love and attention that people have within the church here, let's just, just turn it out a little bit more. Let, let, let it let it be seen in those places. Very briefly, last question, thank you, comment. Uh, just a comment, Roy, that one of the things we're talking about is um, at our church is, is, is how do you quantify successful ministry? Uh, you train up professional ministers, some of us are in that category, and yet it's not translating. Even if you're growing, if you're not growing by a certain percentage, you're actually declining. Um, and uh, we, we need perhaps to stop trying to measure the success of the growth of God's kingdom in Numbers. Numbers and start seeing it in conversations had. You know, I don't know how many of you feel I get to the end of the day and I've filled in so many forms and I've read so many reports and think, what have I actually done for God's kingdom today? And then you say something nice to somebody who then breaks down in tears, you think, ah, kingdom that's numbers. what I did today. And actually, I think yeah, the time of big buildings is clearly, we will always need somewhere to gather as a people, but what, what I'm hearing a lot of and what we're trying to identify is to stop trying to quantify our ministries as churches in terms of business and set targets. The targets are how many conversations you can have, not how many people you can get into the baptistry, because that will come. I'm just wondering if that may be a helpful idea, because we're, yeah. we're wrestling with it. But actually, as churches decline, God's kingdom is still growing. It's just very hard when you can't see the fruit on a Sunday. And, and so to just be confident in all the things that you guys are sharing with us, just, we're all struggling with it, but it's really encouraging that you guys are here helping us. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and then, I just triple yeah. the thought in there. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how you measure sort of success, uh, I'm chair of our full town pastors, uh, we measure our success in lollipops. Well, that's, that sounds absolutely crazy, but uh, we do have lollipops as a conversation starter. And one year, one single year, when we have a lot of teams and a lot of volunteers, we give about 14,000 lollipops a year. And if you think about even just two thirds of them as a conversation, as yeah. just mentioned, yeah. that, that for me is a success for me. Yeah. You know, it's not about getting people inside the building, yeah. it's about we connect. It's, it, it's, it's valuing and celebrating fruitfulness, isn't it? It's kingdom, isn't it? And we need to get rid of the criteria that measures success by either numerical attendance or attendance at church. 
Uh, or even to expand our thinking about what a fruitful ministry is. I mean, Crossing Places, the Home Mission Fund supported Crossing Places. Crossing Places as an entity doesn't exist now in Glendale Wooler. But if you go to Glendale Wooler now, you'll see an area that was suffering rural deprivation actually beginning to thrive. You'll see churches that didn't actually talk to one another actually working together and doing things like Messy Church and the Warm Hub at the URC. All work that was done through the support of Home Mission Fund and a group that was basically nine people that became 14 people and then became 10, 10 people and then disbanded, it's a work of the kingdom. If you measure it in terms of, well, where was the church? Where was the congregation? How many people? It's a, it's a fallacy to do those things. So it's a very, very good point for you to share, to end on lollipops <laughs> and to be reminded about the kingdom of God and to celebrate and rejoice that God invites us into that missional adventure. Let's use our hands. We're going to close our assembly together with a, an act of worship together. And we have hands, all right? And uh, I'd like you to, to put one of your hands on your heart. Um, because as we seek to join the missional adventure of God, the God who commissions us to go into all the world and make disciples, it's the same Jesus who reminds us of the great commandment, mm. which is to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Mindful of that experience of Jesus in John's Gospel 21, where they are fishing again after the resurrection. And all Jesus asked of Peter after that encounter was, do you love me? And when people discover that we love Jesus, they'll catch something of the overflow. So let's love the Lord our God with all our heart with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And then with one of our hands, let's hold our fists quite tightly. And we were challenged by Haley earlier on. There are things that those disciples had to learn to let go of. And as you think about those things that God might be requiring of you to let go of, perhaps things that have been so familiar, things where we've had entrenched positions on things, or perhaps there are fears, genuine, legitimate fears. I just encourage you to unclasp the tightness and to let them go. To release them so that there's nothing in our lives that becomes stumbling blocks, but that we might op op open hands, open palms, openness to God's Spirit. And then let's put one hand in front of the other hand, holding it, and let's entrust into God's hands our lives, and are calling every one of us to be witnesses for Jesus and to join with God in this great missional adventure. And let's just, just love the fact that we will be held by God. That God can be trusted. Remember hear these words? What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> We've taken a risk and somebody's heard about Jesus. And the work of ministry is the work of God. We're very much the junior partners. There's a notion called prevenience. It's a very sound doctrinal theological statement. I haven't got a clue what it meant, even though I, read, I wrote an essay on it in Bible college and passed. It was years later in a conversation with a friend. I said, Richard, what's prevenience about? I said, Roy, God's been around before you. God's going to be around after you. So just relax, man. <laughs> so let's trust God on this missional adventure. And then with your hands, hands, just reach out. 
reach out. With the desire to, to follow after Jesus, and with our hands, with palms open, to serve in Christ's name, and to reach out to the neighbour in Caledonia Road, to reach out to the person who serves us in the shop, to reach out to the colleague in the workplace, to reach out to the tradesfolk who've come and done work on our houses, to reach out to that care worker who walks past our house every day, tired after a shift. Let's just reach out. And let us do something that Baptists basically do in quiet, but I'm inviting you to do public. I'm inviting you to make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus gave the great commission to go and make disciples, he said, I'll be with you always. We don't do this alone. We don't take lollipops alone. We don't have that conversation, that chat at the end of the day alone. We do so in the presence of the living God who is working out his kingdom purposes. Lord, hear the cry of our hearts that your kingdom may come here on earth, here in the northeast, as it is in heaven. Help us, Lord, not to be intimidated by the challenges, but to be open to the possibilities. Help us not to be daunted by the, the, the issues that we face, but be excited by the prospects of journeying with you into a future that is unfamiliar and uncertain and unknown. But to, we trust you, Lord, we trust an unknown future to you, a known God, Help us, Lord, as we heard scripture this morning, to be fishers of men and women and deliver us from simply being the keepers of aquariums. Mm -hmm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.